Warning. This channel covers multiple real-life true crime stories and will dive into some graphic or disturbing details of death or abuse. Please do not continue if this is something that you will not be comfortable watching. Viewer discretion is advised. Diego County, California, 2010. It was a wonderful time. Movies like Frozen and The Tooth Fairy are on the big screen. According to the statistics, songs like Oh My God and Like a G6 were blaring on the speakers in everybody's Toyota Camry and Honda Accords as they drive by. Everything about early 2010 gave the promise that 2010 is ramping up to be the great year. For many of us, 2010 ended up being just that. For others, well, this year has garnered the nickname the year the earth struck back. There were earthquakes, heat waves, volcanoes, floods, super typhoons, blizzards, landslides, and droughts that were all responsible for approximately a quarter million deaths or more that year alone. One statistic that I have read states that more humans were killed by natural disasters worldwide in 2010 than the amount of deaths caused by terrorists over the past 40 years combined. This story is not about the natural disasters that occurred in 2010, but instead, this story is about one unnatural disaster that took place in San Diego County itself. Joseph McStay, his wife Summer, and his two sons Gianni and Joseph Jr. lived in their new home in Fallbrook, California. Joseph was a 40-year-old entrepreneur, craftsman, and handyman. His 43-year-old wife Summer helped with the business, also while being a full-time mom to four-year-old Gianni and three-year-old Joseph Jr. The business that Joseph was running was titled Earth Inspired Products and was a fairly successful indoor-outdoor custom water fountain manufacturing and installation company. Joseph was known as the hands-on engineer and creative side of the company, while Joseph's fellow co-worker and employee Dan Cavanaugh was known for being more of the internet whiz or the computer guy. As of early 2010, Earth Inspired Products was manufacturing fountains for a number of clients and had sales worldwide, some sales reaching as far as Saudi Arabia. Due to the nature of the work, Joseph found himself having to hire the odd tradesmen to help complete the fountains. I would assume this was to ensure the quality, durability, and longevity of Joe's products. One day, Joseph was working on a job that required an experienced welder, and after some discussions with his co-worker Dan Cavanaugh, and likely some talks with his wife Summer, Joseph decided to reach out to Charles Chase Merritt and hire him for a job. Joseph and Charles went on to have an ongoing business relationship, which operated on a need-for-work basis. Between the days of February 4th and February 6th, the mixed day family and friends started to notice that Joe and Summer had not been answering any phone calls or responding to any messages. This was odd for the two of them. On February 6th, Joseph's brother Mike decided to head over to his brother's house and see how the family was doing and possibly ask what's going on. Upon arrival to the home, Mike noticed that the family's dogs, Bear and Diggy, were both freely roaming the backyard and that there was water in the dog bowls. Mike assumed at this point that somebody must be coming to the house to take care of the dogs and that his brother and his family just went on a trip of some sort. Mike decided to move the dog bowls to another part of the yard so that when he came back the next day, he would be able to determine that somebody was in fact taking care of the dogs for the family. When Mike returned the next day, he was happy to find that somebody had moved the bulls and that somebody was in fact feeding his brother's family's dogs. Since the family had no changes in the cleanliness of the house, he still felt things seemed strange and abnormal. Mike decided that at this time, he was going to leave a note for whomever has been filling the dog bulls stating that he was the brother of the homeover and that he was very worried about his brother and to please call The next day, Mike's phone began to ring. When he got his phone out of his pocket and looked at the screen, it read, Animal Control. Animal Control went on to inform Mike that they were not asked by anybody to watch after the dogs and that they had only come by because they had received some reports about the dogs being left outside. They told Mike that they had decided to fill the food and water bowls for the dogs every day just in case something had happened to the homeowners or if they had been forgotten. As you can imagine, this only led to an increase in anxiety and concern as to where his brother Joseph and his family could have gone. Over the following days, and a continuation of the lack of response from the family, Joseph's mother decided to report the situation to the local law enforcement. Law enforcement immediately began their search inside the mixed-day home. 
At first glance, everything appeared fairly normal inside the house, and was actually reported that there was no signs of struggle. Law enforcement found some groceries lying out and opened, including some eggs and an apple. They also found popcorn in the couch, and several toys sprawled on the floor. During the search of the upper level of the home, law enforcement found some lamps knocked over, and drawers opened, but nothing actually missing. They also found several luggages partially packed with clothes folded and toiletries inside. Due to the nature of the situation, the investigators seemed inclined to believe that the family was fine and off on a mysterious road trip of some sort. Due to this belief, investigators became complacent and failed to treat the mixed-day residence as a possible crime scene, leaving nearly all of the possible DNA in the residence contaminated and not useful if needed for later testing. During the early days of the investigation, law enforcement spoke to all neighbors of the mixed-day family. Although none of these neighbors were witness to anything that happened to the family, one neighbor had a security camera pointing in a direction where it was able to actually capture the mixed-day family's vehicle and a Susu trooper leaving the mixed-day's residence. Unfortunately, the video captured by the camera was too low of a resolution to make out any of the occupants inside the vehicle. On February 8, 2010, the family's Isuzu trooper was located in a parking lot near the U.S.-Mexico border in San Isidro, California. Based on witness statements, the investigators were led to believe that the family vehicles parked there between 5.30 p.m. and 7 p.m. that day. The vehicle had new toys in the cargo area, which were covered with blankets. Because of this find, local law enforcement began to research into the possibility that the mixed-day family had made a last-minute decision to go on a trip to Mexico. Throughout this search, they managed to uncover recent Google searches for traveling to Mexico and passports for children on a computer in the mixed-day home. And on March 5, 2010, investigators publicly released a security video of the U.S.-Mexico pedestrian gate, dated on February 8, 2010, around 7 p.m., and it actually seems to show the silhouette of a man and a woman walking hand-in-hand -hand with two young children. This had led many people to believe that the mixed days were okay. This did not have the same effect on the family of the mixed days. Several statements from the family were made about this video and how they did not believe it was Joseph, Summer, and the boys. They asked, why would they walk? They asked, why would they abandon their dogs at home and leave? They asked, why not tell a single person where they were going? On top of all that, Joseph's mother and father and brother Mike all believed that the man in the video had a different height, weight, and build than Joseph. Joseph's mother even stated in an interview that the walk of the man in the video was absolutely not Joseph's walk. Unfortunately, despite the family's public beliefs and observations about the video, the sequence of events left law enforcement overly focused on the innocent trip to Mexico theory. The media took a hold of this in Mexico, and people began handing out flyers, taping missing posters to posts, speaking of the family over the radio, and even having some direct contact to locations, hoping that a witness would show up somewhere. This definitely seemed like this could be promising, as a number of phone calls and emails came in about possible sightings and possible interactions with the family. When these tips were followed up, though, they all seemed to come up short. After several years had passed, and the return of the Mixed Day family did not come to fruition, the family and friends of the Mixed Days began to lose hope and to start to cope with the unfortunate reality that they were living. Then, breaking news hits the TV. On November 12, 2013, a random man riding a motorcycle in the middle of the Mojave Desert believes that he has stumbled across bones. He takes a look around and calls 911. Tonight, 10 news sources are revealing new details to us about the desert crime scene where the bodies of the McStay family from Fallbrook were discovered. Law enforcement immediately begins a search into the bones found in the middle of the desert. After the initial observation, many more forensic investigators were called to the scene. It has been reported that an anthropologist and a team of diggers had spent multiple days uncovering and logging the remains from that day. After countless hours of gently digging and brushing, the site was labeled as a mass grave site where the skeletal remains of four people had been found. It was revealed that the dental records of two adult remains matched that of 40-year-old Joseph McStay and 43-year-old Summer McStay. 
After additional testing, it was confirmed that the other two remains matched that of four-year-old Gianni and three-year-old Joseph Jr. as well. Inside the grave, investigators found a white extension cord wrapped around Joseph's neck and a three-pound hammer lying next to the bodies. An extensive examination of all of the items found in the grave, as well as the bodies of the family, was completed. Investigators were able to make the determination that Joseph and Summer were both murdered by blunt force trauma to the head. One of the son's skulls was found to have been bludgeoned by a hammer, an estimate of seven times. It was clear at this point that the mixed day family had fallen victim to a crazed lunatic of some sort. This type of news could have only come as shock and horror to the friends and family of the mixed day family, and would have left many people disturbed and exhausted. Fortunately for the investigators, this news painted a new perspective on the case. This was a murder. A precisely calculated murder where a beautiful family of four was brutalized. But for what reason? Why would somebody do this to harmless kids? The investigation ramped up following this discovery, honing in on anybody who had been an initial suspect but may have been excused due to any of the conflicting evidence that had been uncovered. One year following the discovery of the mixed day family grave, law enforcement announced the arrest of Joe's ex-welder and employee, Charles Chase Merritt. Initially, investigators had a close eye on Merritt, as he seemed to speak about Joe in the past tense, speaking of him while using words like, he was a great guy, or he used to love doing that, etc. Charles slipped up in multiple interviews, seemingly doing the exact same thing. As far as you know, you were the last person, or at least one of the last people to see him, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, when he left Rancho Cucamonga, nobody else, uh, although I, th I think somebody, there's another person or two that he talked to, I'm not sure. Um, but you were the last person he saw. I'm the, definitely the last person he saw. After speaking to Merritt again in 2014, law enforcement dug further into the investigation of Charles this time and managed to find a plethora of evidence tying him to the disappearances. Law enforcement managed to uncover friends and family of Chase, claiming that he has a history of trouble with the law, including felony robbery. Others stated that Merritt had an excessive gambling addiction, one of which constantly got him into financial trouble. It is believed that at the time of his disappearance, Chase owed Joseph McStay approximately $30,000 in loans that he had asked Joseph for to help him get out of any gambling debt that he was in. It has also been said that Joseph spoke to Dan Kavanaugh in the days before his disappearance and told him that he'd planned to let Chase go and not work with him anymore. On November 7th, 2014, the county law enforcement released a statement saying that Charles Chase Merritt was being charged for four counts of murder in association to the McStay family. In the following months, Charles Chase Merritt went on to delay his trial in any means possible. He would claim that after a recent diagnosis of congestive heart failure, that he believes he only has months left to live. He would file motions to request to have his attorney replaced multiple times. He would also eventually go on to request that he defend himself in court and act as his own attorney. Not sure why he did this exactly. Some people have speculated that it was an attempt to speed up the duration of his trial in relation to his health issues. On January 6, 2019, the trial of Charles Chase Merritt is set to begin. The prosecution showed up with one clear intention, to tell the jury exactly how Chase murdered the McStays and why Chase should get the death sentence for his crimes. The attorneys presented the means, the motive, and the opportunity to the court, and went over some very striking evidence that they had uncovered since 2010. Something of interest was an email that Joseph had sent Chase in the days before the disappearance. Joseph clearly was unhappy with Chase's work. He went on to ask Chase for $42,000 from a job that Joseph felt Chase had botched. After this email, instead of negotiating with Joseph, Chase went on to write himself a series of checks from Joseph's company QuickBooks account, about $21,000 worth. Prosecutors were able to show that Chase was actively logging into Joseph's QuickBook accounts in the days surrounding the disappearance. On February 5th, the day after the family was last seen alive, Chase Merritt wrote himself another number of checks from Joseph's business account, to himself, this time totaling $16,000. Chase then backdated the checks to February 4th, as he was confident Joseph was still alive and seen by friends and family on the 4th. He then deleted these checks from the system, I would assume in a panic of some sort. Maybe he realized just how risky it would be if it were found by the police. Unfortunately for Chase, he did not understand that the deleted checks were still recoverable. Prosecution was able to highlight the multiple locations that Chase's cell phone pinged off of. They were able to show that on the night of February 4th, Charles' phone pinged off of a tower that would place him in the area of the mixed day family home. They also showed that on February 6th, 2010, Chase's phone was found pinging off of cell phone towers in the vicinity of the mixed day family grave in the middle of the Mojave Desert. 
It was also presented that Chase's DNA was found on the steering wheel of the mixed-day vehicle. The prosecution's theory was that Chase had been going down a bad road for a long time. He had run-ins with the law in his past, and he was aggressively addicted to gambling. He found himself in dangerous financial situations often and would find irresponsible ways to temporarily rectify these situations so he could just go back to gambling and continue the cycle again and again. They went on to paint Chase as a heartless, immoral person that when challenged by somebody who had helped him for so long, he snapped. He planned a merciless murder and eliminated an entire family because of it. He also did it in such a calculated way that the relatives of the mixed day family would go on to spend the next four years following the disappearance searching the world for them. Chase was in very hot water. He was facing the death sentence. The defense came out strong, wisely deflecting all of the evidence towards another suspect, Dan Kavanaugh. When speaking about Chase to the jury, Chase's defense attorneys painted Chase as another victim in all of this. As a sad friend of the McStays that is simply being misinterpreted as a crazed murderer, they used Merritt's lack of computer knowledge to refute claims of the company QuickBooks use, and they used hardware technicalities to prove some inconsistency with the cell phone tower information presented. The defense seemed to insist that despite Dan Kavanaugh's Hawaiian alibi, that Dan was much more capable of achieving this. Dan was the computer guy, after all. Sure, his passport and lodging information may have shown that he was in Hawaii, but with a murder this planned out, wouldn't a solid alibi be the final step? The trial was grueling and lasted about five months. The defense and the prosecution both had intelligent arguments and interesting witness testimony. The judge maintained a professional courtroom and the jury appeared to present little to no issues. After deliberating for three days, the jury came back with a verdict of guilt on all counts. On January 21st, 2020, Charles Chase Merritt was sentenced to life in prison and was given the death penalty by lethal injection. Chase is still alive today and is residing in the San Quentin State Prison on death row. Chase has claimed his innocence since the beginning of this tragedy and still maintains it to this day. Even with the overwhelming amount of evidence against him, one still has to wonder whether or not Chase committed this crime. Chase has claimed that he and Joseph met on February 4th at a Chick-fil-A to speak about a new job and how to make things work with their current business arrangement. If this is true, this makes the cell phone tower pings on the night of February 4th somewhat understandable. Also, looking at the way this crime was planned out leaves an eerie feeling that Chase could have fallen victim to some type of framing. The murderer was able to plan a time that absolutely zero neighbors noticed anything weird or could see anybody out of place. Since the mixed day vehicle was caught on surveillance leaving the house on February 4th at 8pm, the murderer likely had planned this in advance to use the mixed day vehicle as a way to transport the family out of the house. The murderer planned enough in advance to not leave a crime scene at the mixed day residence and even partially pack luggage to stage the mixed day home to look as though the family left on a trip of some sort. The murderer planted the vehicle near the border to deflect the law enforcement on a hunt through Mexico and off of their trail. The murderer managed to do all of this without being caught on any cameras clear enough to identify them. For somebody to plan and achieve all of these feats, why would they be so reckless as to write themselves checks in the midst of the murder? Why wouldn't they arrange a solid alibi? Could Dan Kavanaugh have arranged all of this and wrote the checks to Chase to frame him? Could Dan Kavanaugh have a solid alibi simply because he purposely set one up? That's not for me to answer, though. The questions do linger. In any case, I truly believe that the jury got it right, and I want to continue believing that. Charles Chase Merritt was a disgusting lunatic that took the lives of two lovely adults and two beautiful babies, all in the act of calculated greed. It appears Chase genuinely believed he could solve multiple personal problems by murdering an entire family of four. As of today, in 2021, it appears he may never open up about it. Three things we know for sure after watching this video. One is that this was a despicable tragedy that a family should never have to endure, and my heart goes out to anybody who is directly or indirectly affected by this. The second is that Charles Chase Merritt is an absolute monster with zero moral compass. This complete piece of shit murdered babies for self-gratification. And the third is the only gambling Chase will be doing from now on will be for an extra slice of bread during mealtime.